at extended, and a special edge type indicating that we're using a condition code edge here. This is one of the ways in which the selection DAG is lower level than the LOMIR. That we actually explicitly represent these things directly. Here's a 64-bit multiply, same story, except multiply is a little bit more complicated. Um, in particular, it involves a node that has multiple result values, and I just wanted to show that. Legalize is heavily parameterized by the target, by individual target nodes. And in addition to targets being able to specify custom behavior, they can actually have custom nodes. So here we have a conditional branch being legalized for x86 using a special x86 specific node type. And targets can define any number of their own node types to aid in legalization. After legalization, we actually run the combined phase again because there's often more opportunities for optimization. Uh, one of the things that happened here, we were multiplying, our 64-bit multiply was being multiplied by the constant 101. That means that the high part of the multiply ended up multiplying by zero. That's obviously something we can simplify. <laughs> um, I'm also going to point out that uh, the combine is an iterative pass, so it'll notice after simplifying the multiply to zero, that result was added. So we can simplify that whole zero multiply add chain down into a single zero. Now that the graph has been legalized and simplified and canonicalized, now we're actually going to in, into selection, instruction selection proper. This is sometimes called DAG to DAG instruction selection in the source for historical reasons. So I'm going to show a few examples of instruction selection in action. This is the add that does the loop control variable, it's just adding a variable by one. Uh, we're compiling for x86, so we select this to an INC instruction inc. Um, at this point, this opcode corresponds directly with an x86 machine opcode. And the R on the end of, the, on the end of that opcode means that the operand is hopefully going to be in a register. Um, if we end up spilling the register, it could end up turning into an M. But for now, we're going to say everything is going to be in a register. The instruction selection phase is also capable of folding multiple nodes into a single instruction. So here we have a floating point add and a load. And on x86, these can be selected into a single add SD. Um, the R indicates that the, uh, one of the operands is in, in register, and the M indicates that the other operand is in memory. Um, you can notice that the add SD RM node has a lot more operands than the original add and load did. This is because instruction selection is also responsible for matching the addressing mode. So we'll actually climb up the tree of the, the selection DAG that produced the address and recognize adds and shifts and fold them into the addressing mode for the load. The select phase uses uh, a set of uh, a sort of custom language for describing instructions that can be used to match nodes and transform them into machine specific nodes. Um, I selected this example from the PowerPC target because it's nice and simple. Uh, X86 is more complicated. So, this is the basic description of an instruction, and there's lots of these. Uh, and there tends to be, in many instruction sets, a lot of redundancy. So we use a simple macro language. Uh, DForm2 is a simple macro expansion for a common type of PowerPC instruction. And 14 is a parameter telling the, instruction, uh, telling the code generator an opcode to use when this is being jitted. So we're actually going to be building up information about the binary encoding of the instruction with this. Uh, we also have operands indicating the output parameters and the input parameters. Um, this is actually a string for the assembly printer. It will actually fill in the dollar sign things, much like a printf will fill in format specifiers with individual registers and the actual immediate value. Um, in this file, we can also have scheduling class information. So this is in the int general scheduling class. And then finally, we have a pattern to match. This is at the heart of how instruction selection works, is it actually matches this sort of pseudo Lisp-like syntax with a tree in the DAG, and it will match it into this instruction. After we've selected the machine opcodes that we want to use, now we go into the schedule phase. At this point, we use a significantly simpler graph. At this point, we can cut out all the constant <coughs> immediate values and all the basic block operands and measure the things that the scheduler doesn't need to worry about. The schedule graph, uh, nodes in the schedule graph are called S units, and we actually explicitly track predecessors and successors in the scheduling graph. Those are called S steps for our scheduling dependencies. 
Um, one of the interesting things that happens in the schedule graph is that our add carry and our add extended were actually folded into a single node here. This isn't strictly necessary on x86, but this is currently what we're using. It's a simple approach to make sure that the flag operand, the condition code, doesn't get clobbered by some other node getting scheduled in between the add with carry and the add extended. We also use a special technique um, to minimize the number of copies that are needed. So the x86 in construction is a read, modify, write, which clobbers its input. Um, in order to avoid nodes that need to use that input, requiring a copy to get the original value, we insert special dependencies into the scheduling graph to tell the scheduler, put every node that needs this input register above this ink so that they don't have to have a copy. In certain complicated situations, um, this can cause the scheduler to get in trouble. So the scheduler knows that those are special dependencies and they can be removed if it gets in trouble. Those are not required for correctness. They're just required as an optimization. So the scheduler's job is to do a topological sort in this graph. Um, and I've shown a sample select schedule. And at the top, you can see that the schedule uh, is not unique. There are multiple ways to schedule this graph correctly. And the decisions that the scheduler make can either be done to optimize for register pressure or to optimize for latency. Another thing that the scheduler has to worry about that's not obvious from the graph is physical register dependencies. So in, the ex in this example here, there's a multiply node. On x86, the multiply instruction explicitly reads the EAX registers and the EDX register. Um, and those are things that we can't easily represent in a dependency graph. So those are extra information that's not shown here that the scheduler has to keep in mind. The output of the scheduler is finally a linear sequence of instructions. Now we have the opcodes and we have the order that we want the opcodes in. The final task here is to fill in all the dependency edges with virtual registers and the result is something that's ready to be handed off to registry allocation. So the selection DAG framework is capable of doing a lot of things. We're hoping to make it do a lot more things in the future. Uh, coming very soon is a new legalized types infrastructure that's being worked on by Duncan Sands. Um, what this is going to do is split the current legalize phase into two parts. We're going to legalize types, like the I64, separate from legalizing operations. For example, like a, a target that does not have an integer divide instruction, but has an alternate sequence that could be done. Um, that's legalizing an operation. That will be split into a separate phase. Um, we're also looking at extending the selection DAG framework to handle single entry, multiple exit regions. Currently, we can only handle single box at a time. We'd like to handle larger regions. Um, to get more optimal instruction selecting and better scheduling. And eventually, we're looking at having whole function selection DAGs. This will require a lot of scalability work because we're going to be representing